All right, guys, so this is the breakdown of um, lesson 4.3. I think what I'm going to start with is sharing my screen and getting into what you would see with uh, Canvas. So obviously we're in poetry. That's what all of Unit 4 is basically kind of centered around. We did the poetic uh, essay um, about the hummingbird and uh, stuff like that and now we're kind of into an actual poem and I didn't want to start off this lesson the way it's wanting me to with choral reading and I'm going to show you what I mean by that but I'm, I'm decided to show you how I like to break a poem down that was shown to me a few years ago and I kind of wish I'd have known this strategy when I was in high school because poetry was my weak point and it really kind of still is so when you get into Unit 4 modules and you pull up your Lesson 4.3 instructions, your L4.3, um, I'm just going to kind of walk you through this here step by step. So Lesson 4.3 instructions, you are reading closely and analyzing the meaning and structure of a poem, analyzing literal and figurative meanings represented in a poem, and identifying and explaining the central metaphor of a poem. Um, and notice the poem is called Ode to the Table, one stanza at a time. Now, Ode means to praise, and we want to keep that in mind. And this is the title of the poem. And one thing you want to really uh, keep in mind when you're reading a poem is always remember the title, what's the subject of the title, what is the title about, and keep reminding yourself what the title of the poem is. So obviously, I'm going to get a lot about a table. Um, so this lesson builds on the previous two by continuing the focus on poems that praise and by taking a part-to-whole approach to analysis. So where you previously used paragraphs as a structural basis of your work with Joyous Valadoris, you will now use the stanza in your analysis of Ode to the Table, uh, which is a poem by the Nobel Prize winning Chilean poet Pablo Nuerta, uh, translated by Ken Krabenhoft. So through oral reading and academic conversation protocols, and it's going to be more academic conversation prep because we're going to use the discussion board on Canvas, you will unlock the meaning of each stanza and then come to understand how the overall progression of stanzas develops the poem's central metaphor. So part one, Ode to the Table, a reading based on structure. So in the student workbook module, you have Ode to the Table is provided by a link to make a copy. If you were in class, you received a paper copy. Um, I highly advise those of you that are not here to be in class to make a copy or a print out a copy of this particular poem because that's how I'm going to show you how to break it down. Now there are ways to break it down virtually, it's just not as, it doesn't work as well as I like it to work on paper. So notice that it says online students will need to make a copy and either print that copy or use a separate sheet of paper to note each chunk of the poem. Um, or you can use the comment feature in Google Docs as we break down the poem as well. There's also another way that you can do this, and I'm going to show you all of those ways virtually before we begin. So O to the table is, I already have it up on my um, bit here, and I'm going to give myself more room to see real quickly apologize. So here's O to the table. So the ways that you can do this is have this open and just have a piece of paper on hand and telling yourself where you broke it down. Uh, another way you can do this is by selecting the pieces you're going to be breaking down. So I'm going to be looking at these first and I'm going to add a comment and I'm going to write my stuff over here in the comment section. And the other way you can break it down is because this is your copy, you can hit the enter button and then I would actually change my feature to write from the right hand side of the page and I would even go as far as to change the color of my font and maybe make it a little bit bigger and italicize it and uh, write your notes here and you know that those notes go with this particular piece. Um, and if you need to continue to cover up the pieces of the poem that you don't want to see, you can always hit control and the plus button. And it's going to make your screen bigger to where you're only seeing what it is that you need to see. To minimize that, you want to hit control minus and it brings you back down. So I'm going to take all this back away so anybody who's um, selecting this isn't getting those areas showing up as well. All right, so to continue on, 
um, before we start breaking it down, it does, uh, these instructions kind of walk you through a few things. So it says, um, as we view the poem, consider the following. Joyous Veladoris is an essay organized by paragraphs. How is Ode to the Table organized? Very simply seen as you look at your printout, um, most likely you notice the organizational structure is that of stanzas. You should also notice the other chunks of meaning within each stanza. You've got individual lines, you've got complete thoughts that are indicated by punctuations, you've got periods, you've even got one exclamation point. So as a class, we'll chunk the poem in smaller pieces for better comprehension. Your directions are to read the poem, um, and I will read it once aloud for you, and make notes to, uh, next to each represented piece. So the notes can include any of the following pieces. What you see, what you think, like initially. Don't sit there and try to dig deep, guys. Put the shovels down. It's what's right in front of you. Just what the, what's the first thing that pops into your mind is what you want to take notes on for a poem. What you may predict will happen next will be perfectly fine. What you understand about what's going on in that particular piece of the poem. Or you can even ask a question. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to change um, my Zoom to my uh, Abervision or however you want to describe that. Okay. So... Ode to the table. Remember, ode means to praise. So we are praising a table. So again, I told you, you really want to make sure you put a lot of stock in that particular um, title. So if you only have a single page, and this is, this is for y'all that do this in the, in the future. If you only have a single page poem, you want to take the page and you want to fold it where you only see a little bit of the poem and sometimes I kind of skim the poem a little bit where's a good place to stop I think it's right there so I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna fold this and, I, and you're gonna have creases it's gonna be messy but trust me it's well worth it what's great about this poem it's a two pager so I'm just gonna take my second page and cover it up making it less messy I do draw lines showing myself where I uh, had my break and what I'm looking at here versus right here. Now there's other ways that you can do this. You can look at the entire piece that you're reading or you can break down line by line by line or these two lines go together, these two lines together go together. There's not one right perfect way to do this. So when I read this first piece of the stanza one, I work out my odes on a four-legged table laying before me bread and wine and roast meat. So lay out my praise. I'm going to remind myself what that means. I got a four-legged table, bread, wine, and roast meat. So I'm thinking dinner. I work out my praise. The first thing that pops into my head is praying before a meal. And I just write it. Just the minute it pops in my head, I write it. So praying before a meal. It's a very practiced uh, Christian culture um, or a uh, uh, very known practice of Christian culture, I should say. And we've all seen people do this, even if we don't practice this in our own house. We see people do this either in movies or in TV, um, in real life. So this is, this is not far-fetching right here. Once I have that, I'm going to go to the next piece. All right, so the black boat of our dreams. Sometimes I set out scissors, cups, and nails, hammers, and carnations. So these are kind of funny how they're linked together. So those are very contrasting things together. That's a little weird. The black boat of our dreams. What's really funny is here he's starting to use a plural. Like there's more than one of them, but then he goes back to the I being singular. So that's kind of, that's kind of weird too. So um, uh, maybe loss. He lost somebody, a nightmare, something bad happened. All right, and then sometimes I set out scissors, cups, and nails. And honestly, the first thing I think about is all the stuff that you could possibly use the table for. So scissors I think of little projects my son has a project an animal project that we're gonna have to do here soon and I'm gonna have scissors and glue and tape and papers and all kinds of things on my table on my dining room table as we work out his uh, animal project he chose the Komodo dragon isn't he something guys um, cups and nails so I'm not gonna worry about the contrast of those things together too much I'm just gonna kinda write what I see so cups I see a social gathering of people gathering at a table 
with cups and drinking and talking. Um, we're drinking water here, people. Nails, you have, and, and hammering to building stuff on a table. You need a table to build. You don't want to build on the floor. It's going to be bad for your back. Carnation, so at a table, you're going to have a centerpiece typically. Carnations are flowers, if you didn't know. If I didn't spell that right, it doesn't matter because, again, I'm just trying to get my thoughts from here into my head and right back on paper. All right, so stanza two is really short, so we don't have to worry about breaking this one up. Tables are trustworthy, titanic quadrupeds. They sustain our hopes and our daily life. Okay, and then quadrupeds. So that's kind of a word that we don't see very often, so you want to cut it into of what you do know. You know quad means four. I know a lot of y'all know that's almost common knowledge at this point. Um, and ped, uh, think about pedicures, feet, legs. Tables are typically four-legged. So I can come to that conclusion based off what I'm given in the word itself. <clears throat> So what do we think when we see here? Um, we almost trust, we, we use tables almost subconsciously um, without even realizing we're using them or taking them for granted. Um, they sustain us in our daily life. So like uh, I think of my daily, my daily table by the door that holds my mail. It holds a bowl of mask now which is a little sad. Um, it holds uh, homework, keys, and all kinds of stuff. So anything that I use daily, um, and they're trustworthy, so there's some personification there. Um, we <clears throat> are constantly using tables. Okay. All right. Uh, and even like with hopes, I mean, we're constantly using tables. We use tables to discuss everything, to lay out everything. Like we trust them endearingly. So stanza three is really long and you see it goes on to the next, uh, to the next sheet. So um, as I kind of skim here, I think I'm going to end it right there. So you have, and again, I'm going to draw my line here since I'm going to break this one up in a few pieces. So you have a rich man's tape, the rich man's tables rolled and shining as a fabulous ship bearing bunches of fruit. Um, so you can take this one or two ways. Um, rich people have tables too. So even though I might have a, a, a typical table, one that's not very uh, fancy, um, Tables represent their owner, maybe. Um, very fancy, uh, possibly expensive, because he compares it to a boat. And I know what rich people boats look like. I wish I had one. I have a boat. Um, it's not fancy. It's it actually doesn't even work. So you can take it as that. You can write anything else you see here. And I'm going to do one more. Um, I'm going to do one more with y'all, and then you're going to do the rest of these on your own. Um, so you'd pause the video, you'd continue on the rest of stanza four, uh, rest of stanza three and stanza four, breaking it up where you, I'll actually tell you where you probably should break it up, but you're still going to do the rest on your own, and then you'll come back to the video to continue. So uh, this last piece here says, Gluttony's table is a wonder piled high with gothic lobsters, and there's also a lonesome table in our aunt's dining room. In summer, they've closed the curtains, and a single ray of summer light strikes like a sword upon this table sitting in the dark. <clears throat> so we have gluttony's table is piled high. So like gluttony is, is, is excessive. It means too much, an over excess in something. So gluttony equals too much. And then you have the ants table is lonesome. So you have the lonesome table. So this is missing something. It's missing like a person possibly. So I'm thinking she's lost somebody. There's death. Death has happened um, possibly in the summertime. 
they've closed the curtain so when you close the curtains on something it usually means the end so again that kind of represents to death again the end of somebody's life maybe um, strikes like a sword upon this table sitting in the dark so it's like it's cutting it in half so on the other side of death which you could say gluttony is there is too much of something and you really don't want too much of life but basically life is is full too much full and and death is lonesome it's missing so those are the little things that just kind of pop in my head and as I'm thinking I'm writing them down and I'm just drawing the conclusions and I'm using arrows and I'm I'm using parentheses here and I'm trying to get my mind to think uh, from from one respective idea to the next so as you complete this this is how I would break this up um, to help you uh, prolong through the rest of the understanding that you have so I would mark this together so I would cover this the rest of this up using my other sheet and I would look at this first and then I would finish um, i would finish off stanza three there and then the four stanza I do it in thirds and I'd stop here where the colon is because I know after a colon there's a list gonna happen and I'm gonna just kinda prepare myself to think about what that list might be based off what I get here and then I'm gonna give you all a hint here the world is a table what kind of figurative language is that and that should help answer one of the main questions that we have for this lesson the next piece is here this is your list so this is where I would do the next third piece and then you want to end right there so that's how I would break this particular piece up all right so go ahead and pause the video and come back when you've got the rest of the poem analyzed don't take too long on it stop digging just what do you see on the surface All right, so now that you have finished taking the notes, you're here at part two, um, an academic conversation prep. So each student will be assigned a stanza to answer the following questions in concern with your uh, direct stanza. So here are the four questions. I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these questions. How do you picture the table or tables in your stanza? Literally, how do you picture them? If you've got the rich man's table, what kind of table are you seeing there? Uh, if you've got the table in stanza one, is it just a, a regular old brown kitchen table? What does gluttony's table look like? What does the lonesome ant tables look like? Um, what happens at the table or tables in this stanza? How do you know? So you want to provide evidence here. So what's happening at the tables literally in the stanza and use those quotation marks. What do you think the table or tables in this stanza represent? How do you know? provide evidence. So again, there should be quotations here. You pull in text evidence and now represent that's the figurative meaning. And you've got a lot of that on your notes if you kind of stayed with me and then you used what I showed you truly when you went and did the rest of the third stanza and the fourth stanza. And if you don't have that particular table's representation, you can look at that stanza again and make your observations based off what you see now. Last one's easy. What question or questions does the stanza raise? So like with the first stanza, I don't understand those contrasts very well. I don't get why they put those two particular things together. So looking at it, what don't you understand? What just is completely baffling you? And write that in a question. So you're going to, go in, you're going to want to go to your 4.3. Now, if you open this earlier, before you use this, I have drastically changed 4.3. So if you've opened 4.3 when I first had it to where it was attachment down here, you need to do some new stuff. You need to click here and make a new copy, and then you need to change where it says copy of to your first name and last initial. So you want to make, and even if you didn't make a new one, this is the one you have to make now. So you're going to have this new copy change copy of to your first name and last initial. If you did already have this stuff done, tell me the stanza of which I assigned you. And then you need to go back to your Google Drive and pull up the original L4.3, which it says this in your directions, 
and you need to pull your answers that you had here and place them in the new one. Once that is done, it even tells you for part two an academic conversation protocol. Go to the, dis the discussion L4.3 part two in Canvas and provide one of the following responses. Now, I know you don't have access to my discussions. I don't think you might now that I have a discussion in there. But the easiest thing to do if you're in 4.3 here is just to go to the next button and it takes you straight to that discussion piece. And when you're done providing your discussion, you scroll to the very bottom and click previous. Okay, so in this discussion, notice that the observations and interpretations that I'm offering to start this discussion off is about the first stanza. And I have taken each of those four questions posed and arranged them in a paragraph form. Um, so you must use my initial observation that you see here and provide one of the following responses. So if you choose three, that means you're going to have to do two responses. You have to originally provide new um, build on my response from a previous observation from me and then build on from another student's as well. Sorry. And remember, don't put your stuff in here. You actually want to click on the reply button. Now, again, when you're finished with that, you want to go back to your 4.3 and notice that it, it does tell you, you know, go into Canvas and do this. And then you want to come back here. Before you start this, before you start writing this, I implore you, go back to the instructions first. Go back to the instructions. Oh, one more thing. If I didn't assign you a stanza, here are the stanzas assigned to those periods. Um, obviously, other people got other stanzas assigned if you were in class, but if you were not in class and you did not receive an assigned stanza from me, if you need to use the stanza that I've assigned your period. Um, so I implore you, before you go to write your last piece of analysis, you need to read through part three. I'm not reading this to anybody. It's time for you to do some stuff yourself as well. So you need to read through this part three instructions. When you get down here, you know it's time to answer the prompt. But this gives you a lot of good information and sets your mind up for that analysis writing. Once that is done, you want to come back into 4.3. And you want to, and I'm going to show you what it looks like in student view. And I have these instructions here. Select Start Assignment. Select Google Drive. And you're selecting, obviously, your name and making, your, you, making sure you select the L4.3 that has your name attached to it. That is if you followed my directions. So, that being said, that is 4.3. I would like it to be done today. Today is Monday, the 26th. So we can continue on this week, and I'm hoping to get you all some cold reads with some practice multiple choice questions to help you prep for FSA, which is coming next week. But again, I think you all have done a great job, and uh, you should be proud of yourselves for everything that you've done this year. You've done a great job in regards of all the new stuff that was thrown at us. Um, hopefully this video helped. It wasn't too long, and if you have any questions, please email me, and I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can.